We pray, praise the Lord, Michael Dixie, and we are once again with the Line by Line podcast, the Bible study for your heart and for your soul. We pray that all is well with you once again as we do open up the Word of God. Tonight, we are continuing in our verse-by-verse study through the book of Romans, Romans chapter number two, coming up. Amen. We're glad you're here. Uh, we pray that your day has gone, gone well. Uh, we pray that you'll stay with us for a little bit as we do get into the Word of God. Tonight, as we get into chapter two, uh, we're going to see... Uh, Paul the Apostle uh, begin to address those who are basically the polar opposites of those that he was addressing in the first chapter. We'll get into that as we move along. But once again, we're glad that you're here. And whether you're watching live or whether you're watching on the replay, we pray that something spoken from the Word of God at this time will be a benefit to your heart and life. Amen. If you are watching us over Facebook right now, we ask that you share out this page and others also may be blessed. We are streaming right now live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. Amen. So we are, once again, we're glad that you're here and we, and we pray that our time in God's word will be a good one. We believe it will be. Amen. All righty. We're going to pray and we're going to get right into Romans chapter number two. Amen. Lord, we bless you tonight. We thank you. We honor you. We thank you for allowing us to be here one more time, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that as we open up your word, Lord, that you will give us clarity of mind and heart even as your word does go forth, Lord, because we can do nothing without you, Lord Jesus. We are lost. We are undone. Lord, we pray that you will allow this word to reach those who need that need to hear it. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, that your will might be done, that your word might be spoken in a way that might be understandable to those who will be under the sound of your word. Lord, we just want you to have your way. So Lord, bless us together right now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. All righty, we are in Romans chapter number two. As I just said just a moment ago, uh, that uh, Paul the Apostle, Paul the Apostle now is about to address those who are the polar opposites of those that he was addressing in the first chapter. Uh, Those in the first chapter uh, are those who are uh, unreservedly uh, evil in their ways. Uh, knowing God and not uh, knowing of God, uh, knowing of his righteous judgments, but not willing to obey them, willing to rather fulfill their own desires. And that that's a certain type of individual that lives that way. Uh, but now in the second chapter, he is going to address those who are not, who are not, may not exactly be uh, on the same level or same par uh, as far as sin goes with these that he spoke about previously. But yet and still, there is a problem that he is going to address. Amen. So here in chapter number two, let's begin uh, verse number one. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Now, once again, here he is speaking about, he is speaking to the moralist. He is speaking to the one who believes that because they are not maybe as bad as someone else, as bad as those previously spoken of, that they are sort of in the clear. Well, I'm not that bad. Well, that's not me. So so God's judgment is not on me because that's not me. He's speaking to those that have that sort of mindset. And he's speaking specifically uh, to the Jew, to the Jew. Later on, you're going to see that he is speaking specifically uh, to the Jew. He says here, uh, for wherein thou judgest another, you condemn yourself, for you do the same things. Now, <clears throat> once again, all have sinned, Scripture says, as we're going to read in chapter number three, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so no one is without excuse. No one at all is without excuse. But once again, uh, the hat that people would like to hang their hat on is that they are not bad as the other person. I am not bad as them. That's not me. So, you know, God will withhold judgment as far as that goes for me. It, he goes on, though. But we are sure, verse number two, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. God's judgment, we can rest assured that God's judgment is always true because God's judgment is based on truth. He knows right from wrong, of course. He knows in from out. He knows left from right. 
God's judgment is righteous judgment, and he will judge accordingly. He says, the judgment of God, verse 2, is according to truth against them which commit uh, such thing, such things. Now, in a sense, in a sense, if you go back to Luke, uh, to the book of Luke, when we read the story of the publican uh, and the tax collector, this, in a sense, uh, this, in a sense, is what is taking place here. We know in the story of the publican and the tax collector, uh, we see the publican standing up and saying, uh, thank God I'm not like other men. I do this, 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 and this. And the publican is standing up to the side, knowing that he is a sinner, knowing that he is evil, knowing that he has done wrong. Uh, he says, uh, have mercy upon me. Uh, now, what we see going on here in chapter one and chapter number two resembles that in the sense that in verse number one, you have the, 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 the sinner. The confirmed sinner. I'm a sinner. We, we don't see, of course, what happens uh, later on in uh, with, with the sinner that he says, you know, you know, uh, uh, be merciful to be a sinner. We don't see that happening here. But once again, the knowledge of their own sinfulness, the knowledge of their sin, knowing the right but doing the wrong. That is what's taking place in chapter number one. Chapter number two, it would be as if Jesus was speaking about the publican. Well, I'm not like that, man. I'm not as bad as him. So God, once again, will reserve, will, will keep his judgment away from me. And that's that's kind of what's going on here. Verse number three, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Do you think for a moment, the Holy Spirit is saying through Paul, do you think for a moment that you are going to escape judgment? You're pointing fingers at how bad someone else is and you think that your sin does not warrant judgment and punishment? Do you think that you are going to get away with your sin? No one is going to get away with anything. No one. Amen. That's that's very important to, uh, to understand. Or, verse number four, despises thou the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You hear so many times people say, why doesn't God judge evil? Why doesn't God, you know, why does God allow evil in this world? Why, why is he allowing this person to do that and that person to do that? Why is God yet allowing all of these things to take place? Well, no way that I can get into the mind of God. But here is the, the, the goodness, the forbearance, and the long suffering of God, which are all extensions which are all extensions of God's grace and mercy. These are all extensions of God's grace and mercy. And we see here the heart of God. God is not in the business of pounding submission into people. God is not in the business of forcing repentance out of people. It's not what he does. That's not what he does. Uh, once again, uh, we, we, we spoke about this verse uh, recently, but let me go back to the heart of God in second Peter chapter number three, second Peter chapter number three, verse number nine. This is the heart of God. And we must keep this in mind. This is what, this is how God feels. This, this is what, this is the heartbeat of God. God is once again, God, God is going to, God is going to judge this earth. God's wrath is going to come down upon earth on the planet earth. God's judgment is going to come down upon those who sin and continue to sin. It's, it's, it's going to come to an end at some point. But in the meantime, we are yet living in the age of grace. And mercy and grace are available. And this is the heart of God. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. Let, let, me, start, let me start in verse number 8 because it's that good. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand, a thousand years as one day. Verse number nine, the Lord is not slack. That word slack means slow. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. Well, God is not going to do anything. Look, he's letting all of this pass. He's letting all this slide. Nothing's going to happen. But is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why does evil seem to linger? 
because God is not willing that any should perish. Even those that we deem in our own mind as deserving of punishment, God says, not yet. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God. He wants folk to repent. He wants folk to repent. And that's where the church comes in. That's where you and I come in. Making the gospel readily available. Speaking the gospel. Proclaiming the gospel. Making sure that people hear about Jesus and who he is and what he has done and what he desires to do. We must make Jesus available so that people can hear and be saved. Once again, we understand that not everybody's going to get saved. But we must do our part in that sense. We must make sure that we make the gospel available. Speak the gospel. Speak the gospel. Proclaim the cross. That's what we must be doing. And so he says in verse number four, do you despise the riches and the goodness and the forbearance and the long suffering? Those who say nothing's going to happen. Those who say that, you know, I'm not as bad as the next person. Those who say, look at these people, how can they do this? And the riches of his mercy, rather his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, these things, they're rich. Once again, I say it all the time, we don't know how blessed we are. We don't realize, we, we don't fully, I don't really believe we fully get and understand grace, God's grace, and just how marvelous it is. You're standing, you're living, you're breathing, your heart is, your heart is moving right now because of God's grace. It is grace that keeps you where you are. And that same grace that keeps you where you are is the same grace that is operating in this world. Grace is operating in this world. God causes the rain to fall on the just and unjust. He is not willing that any should perish. But as I said, don't, we should not look at that as a license. God is not saying, okay, do what you want to do until I, until I get ready to deal with you. No, no, no. No, no, no. God's grace, his mercy, his forbearance, uh, his long suffering will ultimately come to an end. We don't know when that is, and we don't know when that is for an individual, but it will come to an end. And when it does, those who those who are deserving of it and those who merit that punishment will receive it, will receive it. But in the meantime, grace and mercy is there. But verse number five, but after thy hardness, an impenitent heart, treasurous up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He says, because of the hardness of your heart and the unrepentant attitude that you have, you are basically people. People are basically storing up wrath for themselves against the day of wrath. God is coming. His judgment is coming, as I've just previously said. His judgment is coming, and it will be swift, and it will be strong. In the meantime, Jesus is here. He is here, and he will save. So we should not, uh, when we look and we see the things that are going on in this world, and we see uh, day after day, it seems like evil just increases. We hear one story in the news and another story in the news, and we sort of scratch our head and we and and we don't want to become desensitized to the things that we hear. But we hear these things and we go, "Oh my, what is going on?" Well, evil evil has taken a grip. Evil has taken a grip. That which is evil is is now good, and and, and we see these things. But once again, God puts this warning in Scripture: You are treasuring up for yourself wrath against the day of wrath. If you think that you are right in doing the wrong thing you know, on an intentional basis, it's not going to work. Verse number six, talking about God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. He will recompense. Once again, the day is coming when those who merit judgment and punishment will receive 
their just rewards in God's own time that will take place. To them, and he's going to make this separation here in verse number seven and eight. To them who by patient, a patient, <coughs> excuse me, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and, immor and, and immortality, eternal life. He's talking about the child of God. He's talking about the child of God. We seek, we seek eternal life uh, through patient continuance or perseverance and well-doing. We, we, we are in Christ. Okay? We are in Christ. But, verse number eight, unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. That's what's coming. That's what's coming for those uh, who are uh, who are self-willed, contentious, self-willed, and and choose not to obey the truth and rather to obey unrighteousness. What's coming for them is indignation and wrath. Once again, the hammer will come down. The hammer will come down for those who merit it, who need it, who who deserve it. Let me put it that way. It, the hammer will come down. Uh, not only indignation and wrath, but verse number nine, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now take note of that. But for the next several verses, he's going to make that distinction between Jews and Gentiles to the Jew first. Why to the Jew first? Because it was to the Jews that the law was given. It was to the Jews that the law was first given. They had, quote, they, they, they had first dibs at the law and they were unable to keep it. But he's going to, he's going to explain all of that. But also to the Gentile. Um, but, uh, but glory and honor and peace, verse number 10, to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. You see, the Jews, the Jews will be held more liable. That, that's what Paul is stating here, that the Jews are held more liable because, once again, the law came to them. God revealed and presented himself to them, not because of anything special in them. We must not come away thinking that the Jews were special, and that's why God revealed himself to them. No, they were not special. They, they were just as sinful as any other group. But once again, just according to God's own uh, own choice that he chose the Jews to reveal himself to. And, and that's all there is to that. Nobody is better. No one group or race or ethnicity is better than another. No, by any stretch of the imagination, no. God just chose in his own, uh, in his own sovereignty, he chose the Jews to reveal himself uh, to. Verse number 11. For there is no, there is no respect of persons with God. No partiality. And what that phrase, respect of person, partiality, what it means is that God does not receive a face. Now, what does that mean? When it talks about God does not receive a face, it means that God does not give any special consideration to anyone uh, based on their status, based on their popularity based on who they are, based on their wealth. God does not give any special consideration to anyone. That is not the criteria by which uh, God goes. The criteria which God uses as righteousness is, do you know Jesus Christ? Have you received Jesus Christ? And Jews, just like Gentiles, that's everyone who's not a Jew, Jews, just like Gentiles, have to come to Christ just like anyone else just like anyone else. And so though though God though the Jews are God's people, you, I hope you understand in the sense that I'm speaking of, he, he chose them, he revealed himself to them, he made his covenant with them, though they are his people, they yet still have to come to him through Jesus Christ. There are no special stipulations, no special consideration because you're a Jew, you, you're going to get in scot-free. No, you still got to come through Jesus, same way as everyone else. All right, that's important to understand. 
Verse number 12. Verse number 12. For as many, as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Now, who, what is he speaking of when he's talked about the fact that as many as have sinned without the law? He's talking about Gentiles, Gentiles, uh, those who are, you know, non-Jews, uh, without the law, though Gentiles did not have uh, the exposure to the law that Jews had, it wasn't revealed to them yet and still, and they will perish without the law. They didn't know the law, but yet and still their sin merits that they will still get punished because they have still broken the law. Gentiles have still broken the law. We, we still broke the law. And he, once again, he's going to explain all of this. Uh, as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Now he's talking about the Jews. The Jews had, had this revelation of God, who he is, his standard of righteousness, his standard of truth. And they were presented it, but they were yet unable to keep it. Once again, there was nothing in the law that would cause them to keep the law, that would make them keep it or to, to empower them to keep it. There was nothing in the law. Here's the law, keep it. Okay, and, and that's what the law was. It was meant to be a, a tutor, a schoolmaster to lead them, to show them that they needed, they needed the help of someone else to keep. And that someone, of course, is Jesus Christ. Verse number 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. And so the Jew has no excuse. He is saying the, the Jew has no excuse. You cannot say because we are the we are the receivers and the hearers of the law uh, that we uh, that we are accepted by God because of this. No, we've already said that there is God has no respect of persons. That's not the criteria. If you heard the law, then you'll go to heaven. Because you all have received the law, you'll all go to heaven. You are all righteous in my sight. No, that's, once again, that's not the standard. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified, acquitted made righteous. That is a legal term, made or declared righteous. Those who keep the law shall not be and cannot ever be uh, declared righteous in God's sight because the law does not save. The law does not save. It cannot save. It was never meant to save. Verse number 14, for when the Gentiles, for when the Gentiles which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Now, that's a mouthful, but it has a very, it has a very simple, uh, it has a very simple meaning. What he is saying, what he is saying here, is that Gentiles who did not have the law, had no exposure to the law, the Ten Commandments, and whatever else was written in the law. When we when we do those things that were contained in the law, when we didn't commit adultery, when we didn't when we didn't lie and steal, when we didn't uh, commit adultery with our neighbor, when we didn't do what the law, uh, when we didn't do what the law prescribed, rather when we did what the law told us not to do, we did it by nature, because innately God has placed God has given us a conscience. He has placed. There is an innate sense of right and wrong in everyone. People know the difference between right and wrong. Of course, as they grow, they, they learn this. But people have an innate sense of what's right and what's wrong. It's, it's just something that is it's just something that is inborn within a people. They know that's not you, you know when something is not right. You know when something is is now when you should not do something now. What we do know is that in the process of time, uh, when we talk about conscience, that that can change. Let's continue reading here. Let me let me continue here in verse number 14. 
when we when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. And so once again, if you betray that which you know, that which you sense is right, and you betray it and do the wrong, you become desensitized. You can definitely become desensitized. And that's what normally happens. Verse number 15, still speaking of the Gentiles, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Let me stop right there. The work of the law is written in the hearts. Once again, that, that innate sense of right and wrong that is in each and every one of us. Though we didn't, if you never if you never heard the Ten Commandments, and I'm just going to use the Ten Commandments as a standard. If you never heard the Ten Commandments, don't do this and don't do that and don't do that. You know when you see something, don't take it. That's you know it's not yours. Not many people betray that and, and take it anyway, but there's something inside that says you shouldn't do that. Don't do that. Okay, there's something inside that says that, and that's once again that innate sense of right and wrong that God has placed within everyone. He says their conscience, verse number 15, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Talking about going, uh, waffling back and forth. Should I do this? Should I not do this? Is, is this right? Is this wrong? The conscience, once again, when you betray your conscience, it can become desensitized. The Bible speaks about uh, a good conscience. The Bible speaks about uh, a clear conscience. The Bible speaks about a defiled conscience. The Bible speaks about a conscience that is seared with a hot iron. And so the, the conscience over a period of a lifetime will undergo changes based on uh, uh, based on external circumstance and based on what an individual has seen and been through in their life, a person's conscience can go through the motions. It can. It can definitely go through the motions. In the day, verse number 16, when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. And that that phrase, uh, that, that, that phrase, my gospel, has always intrigued me uh, when I read Romans, uh, when he calls it my gospel. And of course, he is he he is not telling us that he is the uh, that, that that he is the one that is his gospel in the sense that he owns it, but he has embraced it. He has embraced this gospel that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is this is my gospel. This is what I proclaim. This is what I preach. The gospel, Jesus Christ and him crucified. He has embraced it to the point where he calls it my gospel. The gospel that I preach, okay? He was totally bought in. This is my gospel. Verse number 17, and he's going to hear in these next few verses to the end of the chapter, he is going to speak against, pretty much against hypocrisy, a caution against hypocrisy. Verse number 17, behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God. So once again, we see the argument that will be brought up, that can be brought up by Jews and, and the, an argument that he was probably very familiar with, uh, that the Jews were saying, listen, we're God's people. We are God's chosen people. And he says, listen, you are a Jew and you rest in the law. You rest in the law. You, 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 there's a comfort that you have because of who you are. A certain level of comfort that you have because of who you are. And you make thy boast of God. Well, we have God. We, we, we have God. Who does everybody else have? Okay. Once again, Jews believed that they were uh, that they were not only exclusive, but that the Jews believed that they were superior to others based on their understanding, based on the revelation that God had given them, uh, based on the fact that they had the law, they felt superior to everyone else. But Paul is going to come out against that mindset immediately. Verse number 18, and knowest his will. He says, you know the will of God and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. So you, you have a basic understanding of what is right and what is wrong based on the knowledge that you have been given, 
based on God's standard that has been revealed to you, you know and you approve of the things that are more excellent. The law, being instructed out of the law. Verse number 19, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind. That word blind, uh, he's talking about those that are immature, those that are not schooled uh, in the ways of God and the law. Uh, a light of them which are in darkness. They were, the Jews were, the, uh, the part of the Jew, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that the Jews should be a light, that they should be a light, okay? Um, but were they doing it? Verse number 20, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. So once again, he, he's, he's giving all of these uh, specifics concerning the Jew and their state and their status and what they knew and what they should be about. And they had this, 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 they had this boast and they had this confidence. And as it says in verse number 16, they were resting in the law. They were resting in it. When we see this word rest, it, it, it's a word that induces the idea of just laying back and relaxing uh, and just not having a care in the world. When you, we see this word rest and comfort, and this, is, this was, once again, the mindset of the Jew. Verse number 21, thou therefore, and he's going to come with a series of questions here that is going to uh, cause them to question everything that he just said that the Jew is and that the Jew thinks about themselves. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Okay, are you teaching everybody else? You're, you're, you're trying to show everybody else the way. But are you are you living in the way that you are teaching everyone to live? Are you living up to the standard that you have placed before everyone else? These are words that not just not just the uh, for the Jews here, and he is speaking about the Jews. But these are words that we have to apply to our own lives, knowing the imperfection that is within all of us, understanding the sin nature that that is within all of us. Every preacher, every teacher, every, every every congregate, every child of God needs to take these words and apply them to their own lives. You who say, don't do this and don't do that. You should be this and you should be that. What about you? When you teach others, are you teaching yourself? Are you teaching yourself? Uh, what did the Bible say uh, in the book of James? Let me go there real quick. Lord, just places in my in my spirit real quick, and I'll get right back to Romans. Um, verse, uh, chapter number uh, three, James chapter number three, verse number one. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. What is he saying there? What is God saying there? Uh, he is saying, listen. He says, don't be, don't, don't be in such a, don't be in such a rush to be at the front of the line. Don't be, don't be so anxious to be a teacher and having to have the responsibility to tell everyone else how they should live. D don't do this, okay? It to be to be a of course a pastor, but let's talk about teachers for a moment. To be a teacher of the word of God is a calling. It is a it is a calling. It is not something that one should undertake on their own and proclaim themselves. I'm a teacher. No, we there are no self proclamate. There are no self proclamations. There should be no self proclamations. It is a calling. It is part of the five. What we call the fivefold ministry. If the Lord has called you to teach, then you teach. If, if the Lord has called you to teach, there are going to be certain things that you are going to do. There are going to be certain things that you are going to be about. You are, it, it's just something, as I said, use the word innate uh, just a little while ago. There's something the, the Lord has put that within you to do. But he says, be not many masters. And that word masters is teachers. Why? Because now the responsibility becomes yours. Because he says here, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. If I am going to speak, teach how one should live, 
I must make doubly sure that I am living according to what I am speaking. And that's what he is driving at here back in the book of Romans, uh, Romans uh, chapter number three and verse number 21. Here's what he says. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Are you taking your own advice? Are you listening to your own words? Are you living according to the words that you are meeting out? He says, thou that preaches a man should not steal, dost thou steal? He says, thou that sayest a man should not commit, commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? He says, thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Idols. Are there idols in your life? When you preach or teach against idols, are there any idols in your life? Are there idols in my life? Now, we know that here, obviously, he is talking about idols that were made by hand. He is talking about something that can be touched. But we understand uh, we understand uh, that idols are not just those things uh, which are tangible. We know that idols are also things you can have an idol in, in, in your heart. Uh, an idol can be a person, a place, a thing, an activity. All of these things can be termed as idols. Anything that comes before you and God. This is why John makes this statement uh, in 1 John. Little children, I think it's First or 2 John. Little children, keep thyself from idols. Keep thyself from idols of every kind. Person, place, or thing. And so he says, if you, uh, thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege. Verse number 23. Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, thou, thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. What is he saying there? You, 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 for the Jew, they, they, they talk about not uh, breaking the law, but by their, by their breaking the law, they dishonor God. They dishonor God through hypocrisy. Hypocrisy dishonors God. When a person says one thing and lives another way, it's a dishonor to God. And there are several problems with living that way. Because it causes the world, as we will see here, it causes the world uh, to, take, to, to take a second look at Christianity. And I'm put it, let's put it in the Christian framework. Saying that you are and living another way causes the world to take a second look at what you're saying. Is it real? Does it work? If it, if it doesn't work for you, if you're living like it doesn't work for you, will it work for them? Once again, we must live before the world properly. There's a certain way that we have to live before the world. Okay? No, we're not perfect and no, we're not going to be perfect. But there's a certain way that we must comport ourselves in front of the world. There's just a, there's just a certain way that we ought to comport ourselves. This doesn't mean that we become uh, we become uh, the stepping stone for people. This doesn't mean that we allow people just to uh, take advantage of us and do what they want with us because we we need to have a a, a proper uh, a proper way with people. No, we, we no that that's not what we're trying to say. But we ought to, we are to be lights in this world. And if we are contentious, if we are contentious with the sinner, if we are contentious with those who do not know the Lord, it, it, it's not giving, uh, it, it, it's not proper. The world will look and take a second look, as I said, at Christianity. Is this really something viable? Is this really something that will work? We know that it does work. And when we talk about Christianity, it's not the fact that it works. It's the fact that Jesus saves. It's not about whether it works or not. Jesus saves. He cleanses. He washes. Okay, that's what Jesus does. Verse number 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. The name of God is blasphemed. You see, they were looking at the Jews they were looking, the, the Gentiles were looking at the Jews 
looking at how they lived, looking at how they were not keeping with the law. And the Gentiles said, that's not even right. They're not even right. So forget that. And that's the same kind of witness that we can end up having with the world. If we, if we preach Christ, if we proclaim Christ, if we say that we are living for Christ and we go to our jobs and we don't act accordingly, uh, if we if we say that we are Christians and, and we and we are Christians, we cannot behave any way we choose to before the world. Family, friends, co-workers, neighbors, we can't we can't act a certain way with those who don't know the Lord. Because as it says here, the name of God is blasphemed among the among the amongst the Gentiles, as it is written. And there's a scripture verse uh, in the Old Testament uh, that brings uh, that out. Uh, it's actually in uh, Isaiah. Let me go to Isaiah, uh, chapter number fifty-two. Isaiah fifty-two, and verse number five. Here's what it says. Let me get there real quick. Isaiah fifty-two, and verse number. Five. Now, therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taking, taken away for naught, that they rule over them, make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed because of the behavior of God's people. His name was being blasphemed, not taken into account. It doesn't mean anything what they say. And that's something that we must not allow to happen as we live in this world. Verse number 25. For circumcision, verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. See, circumcision uh, for the Jew was all what was as baptism is for the Gentile and for the Christian, let me put it that way, as baptism is. It's it's something that is outward, but the outward is a, is a reflection of what is on the inside. But if what you have done on the outside does not reflect on the inside, then what have you done? You, you, you have, in a sense, undone what you have done. Okay? Once again, it's a it's identification. Circumstance circumcision was a means of identifying. You were a Jew when you were sanctified, uh, when you were uh, uh, circumcised. When we get baptized after we become uh, born again, once again, it's a means of identification. It's showing those, uh, it's showing those our, our friends and our loved ones that we have that our life has changed. And that Christ, that we have been buried with Christ in his death and raised in new life. That's what we are doing when we are getting baptized. But it's a means of identification. They now know what has happened to me on the inside. But if my life does not reflect that, then what have I done? What have I done? I have I have known, I have known of individuals uh, over my lifetime that, well, let, let's 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 be straight. That were not saved when they got baptized. We're not saved when they got baptized. Okay. Now I'm not a judge, but once again, certain people that I'm aware of were not saved when they got baptized. Let me just just say that. And and what will what will transpire? Well, when they come out of the water, their life is just going to keep going as it was. They're going to try to be a Christian. They're going to try to do the right thing. But once again, if you're not saved, you can't do the right thing. This is why some people get, this is why some people are confused. Some are confused as to why their life just, they, they can't, why they struggle so much. Why they struggle so much. Now we know the reason why some struggle is because they have their faith all wrong. We understand that. That's why some people, some people struggle in the Christian life because their faith is in this thing or that thing or that thing. And their faith is not in, it's not in uh, Christ exclusively. Okay. We, we understand that, but there are others, there are others that have a, a pseudo Christianity. 
based on something that they have done. I, I got baptized. I go to church. If I'm saved. And they're wondering why they're struggling. Many struggle because many, not all, but many struggle because they've never truly gotten saved. They've never gotten saved. But they use it as an argument. I got baptized. So what's what? Some people are not saved. Some people are not saved. So circumcision profiteth if you keep the law. But if you be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Verse 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? He's talking about the Gentile there. If the Gentile, if the Gentile does, if the Gentile does what is right, if the Gentile does what is right, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision, he the 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 the, the Gentile is living as the Jew should live. And once again, we're not talking about salvation. We're just talking about those who, who live, those Gentiles uh, who live a moral life and choose not to do this thing or that thing or that thing. There are people like that. There are people in this world who are not saved, not born again, but they've made a stance that, you know, I, I'm I'm going to be pure or, you know, I don't steal. And, 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 and they're, they're just good moral people. Okay. But we understand that good moral people will not go to heaven either. Okay, we, we understand that. But there are those people that are like that. And so this is what he is meaning here. If the uncircum, uh, uh, therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? That person is living as if they know the law, but they don't. Verse number 27, and shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. Once again, he's going back to the fact that there's this inner, this inner uh, sense of right and wrong that is within everyone. Uh, he says, if it fulfill the law, listen, you are going to be, everyone is going to be judged by the light that they have. The light that they have, everyone is going to be judged. Now, the Jew is going, the, the, the judgment, Paul is stating here that the Jews, their judgment will be stricter in the sense because the law was presented to them. It was presented to them. But for the Gentile, we operate, we, without the law, we operate on the, on the fact of the, the law that is in us. The, the natural things that we do, the natural things that we do that are reflective of God's law we will be judged based on those things, based on what we do or don't do. All of us have sinned. All of us have violated our conscience. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Once again, as I said earlier, if you never heard the law, and you did something wrong, once again, if we break the law in one area, we're guilty of it all. And that's that's something that we have to take into account. Verse number 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward of the flesh. You see, the true Jew, the true Jew is not one that is one outwardly. You're not a Jew just because, just because you have been circumcised. Because you're not a true Jew, okay? Verse number 29. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Inwardly. And how does that happen? And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. A Jew, a true Jew. Now, if you, these are fighting words if you spoke to a, to a Jew. But a true Jew is one who has his heart circumcised. And that's talking about sin. And in his spirit, that is a true Jew. All right? 
and and in that sense in that sense as he describes it we are a we are a drew uh, we are jews in fullness understand what, what i mean by that we are not jews we are we are yet gentiles no doubt about it we are we are born gentile we're not born jews but spiritually speaking a true jew is one who not who, who does not who is, it's not about the circumcision of the foreskin it's about the circumcision of the heart the cutting away of sin in the life that is a true jew that's what makes it that's what makes the change amen that's important to remember and that's important to understand now the next time we come together we're going to get into chapter number three uh, it's going to talk about the fact that god is right god is faithful that god is just and he's going to begin talking about god's righteousness by faith that's going to be in chapter number three. Join us if you can. Amen. So God is good. God is on the throne. I want to thank you for joining us. God bless you, David Walcott, Jeff Williams, Debbie Ann, uh, Brother Mark Goldwire. Amen. Uh, Bishop Michael Brown, uh, Juma Mies, thank you for being here. Rose Dew, amen. Um, Frank Doris, thank you for joining us here today. Amen. God is good. God is on the throne. We honor him and we bless him and we thank him uh, for what he is doing. We we are a ministry, this little ministry here. We're a ministry dedicated to the propagation and proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we do preach and teach the message of the cross for life and living. Uh, and you can help us to get this word out simply by sharing out this page. Uh, if you need to know a little bit more about who we are, you can go to our website at that's the word.org. Uh, you can also go uh, to our YouTube channel, become a subscriber if you have not done so already. You can also go to Spreaker.com, Spreaker.com, that's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. You'll find all the other podcasts that the Lord has enabled us to produce over these years. Amen. Um, there was a time, I must say, there was a time when we were not, uh, when we were not uh, majoring in and preaching the message of the cross uh, as we do now. Uh, and so if you were to go back uh, to our uh, older messages. I'm talking about going back to maybe 20, 2013 and 2014. Uh, you, you, you may not hear, you may not hear uh, the, the, the push and the force uh, of the cross of Jesus Christ, but yet and still, many of these messages still uh, contain a word uh, that I believe still can bless. Um, but you would hear the progression of, of how we began to get into the cross uh, as you as you will listen to those messages, Amen. So God is good. God is on the throne. Uh, we bless Him. Uh, join us tomorrow night as we continue and continue with part two uh, of the two sides of eternity. Uh, last time we got together, we were speaking uh, predominantly about hell. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, we we will we will do our best to speak a little bit more about heaven. Uh, there are many things about heaven. Uh, and the eternal state that we need to uh, go over. I'm talking about heaven, the new heavens and the new earth, and a lot of other questions that uh, that people may have concerning uh, concerning the eternal state. We'll get into that on tomorrow night. Uh, Wednesday night, we're going to continue uh, with our cross talking sessions, and we'll be on uh, second. We'll be on Colossians chapter two, verse number fifteen, and begin speaking about just what the cross of Christ means. To Satan, and I think we know already, but we're gonna we're gonna begin talking about that, amen. Uh, and of course, on Sunday uh, afternoon, uh, we will continue uh, in our series, the final part of our series, Daniel, the man with the excellent spirit, amen. So, so once again, we thank you for joining us. Hope you can join us tomorrow night. If not, you can always catch the replay. Uh, remember, tomorrow night, two sides of eternity, part two, amen. God is good. God is on the throne. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you the next time. Have a good night and may God bless. You. All righty. Bye bye.